Corinthians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Would you all say that with me? Let's try that together. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Heavenly Father, I ask that you will richly bless Gary right now, that you will empower him through your Holy Spirit to preach your truth and your word. And I pray that you, Lord, will open our hearts, our minds, and our ears to receive your word this morning. Thank you for this time, Jesus. Give it over to you. Amen. 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 Good morning. Good morning, Gary. It's a pleasure to be up here. I, I do have a couple of additional announcements uh, to add today. I uh, just wanted to be uh, able to point out to you. There are only eight more shopping days until Christmas. <laughs> this morning, it was single digits outside. It was cold this morning. Ooh, it is here. <laughs> How cold was it? Okay. Let's bring it in. Come on. One more. December 21st, Thursday, is the shortest day of the year. We will have 9 hours, 15 minutes, and 18 seconds of daylight. Sunset will be at 4.31 p.m. Oh, that's the reaction I was hoping for. Now that I brought you down, I come to bring you a little joy. Don't tell my wife I stole it. It sounds joyous to me. How's that? Is that better? I, I did say I was going to share with you enough. Yeah, you did. Made a liar. Can I share something else with you? This being the most wonderful time of the year, I really love the Christmas music. I mean, if it's if it's obscure and if it's different, that's the type of music I like. And dare I say a little bit funky. That's the type of Christmas music that I like. And my family is cringing right now because they're knowing exactly where I'm going. I have this CD called Hipsters Holiday. And I love blasting Hipsters Holiday and, and sharing this crazy music with them. And you know, when the kids were younger, they're like, yeah, go dad. And now they're older and they're like, oh, dad. <laughs> and, but you know, you know, we're going to hear about joy during the year. It's usually this time. You're going to hear about the joy of the season. And I'll tell you, you see it everywhere. I experienced some joy this morning when I bought a delicious cup of Dunkin' Donuts coffee. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's not just about the joy that we see in the decorations. It's not just the joy that we see in, you know, the cards and, and everywhere else when it's displayed. We're singing about it. We're singing about that joy. And, and if I think about, you know, joy to the world, why? Because the Lord is coming. Hark, or, I'm sorry, oh come on ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Hark the herald angels sing, joyful all ye nations rise. God rest ye merry gentlemen, oh tidings of comfort and joy. And then sometimes it gets a little bit more difficult to find it, but oh holy night, a thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. O come, O come, Emmanuel, rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. We're singing about it, but are we living it? You know, this can be such a depressing time of year for some people. It's dark. It's cold. You have the stress of the Christmas shopping. You have the stress of, of making your Christmas meal. And some people are spending it all alone. They don't have others to share in that joy with. You know, and then you look at the commercialization that's happened with Christmas. And how the meaning has potentially been lost how that meaning may have changed beyond the Christmas message. And that's not what it's meant to be. Can we put up Luke 10? And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. 
This was our Advent reading. I read, read it for us this morning. And, you know, some things that jump out to me, it's not just any joy, it's great joy. It's a special kind of joy that we're meant to have. But what about the words right before it? Good news of great joy. There's good news accompanying this joy. And who brought us the good news? Jesus brought us the good news. Look at Luke 4, 42 43. When it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place, and the people sought him and came to him, and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. See, there's a now, but not yet, to this good news. Jesus, he was born, and now we have good news of great joy because of that birth. But then we had to wait, and there was the ministry that followed that, where he preached the good news. But now we wait again for his return, for the good news of his triumphant return. And that should bring us joy, too. You know, I, I looked at trying to find a scripture lesson for this sermon. And I was going to use the Advent reading. I was going to use Luke 2. Uh, Kathy Sharman used the same verses. It talks about peace. I did a great job with that. But it talks about joy, too. It talks about that great joy. I'm like, yeah, that's a good message. But isn't the joy we're supposed to have as Christians supposed to be with us beyond the season? Our joy is not just seasonal. We're supposed to have this joy all the time. And that's what drew me to Philippians. That's what drew me to the verse in Philippians. We put Philippians 4, 4 back up. Rejoice in the Lord always. Not just in this season, always. We're always to rejoice in the Lord. Amen. You know, and, and a few weeks ago, Kathleen O'Galley defined joy for us. Like, paying attention, Kathleen. She defined joy as gladness of heart. And we get that gladness of heart through knowing God, abiding in Christ, and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And some of you might be saying, well, Gary, that says rejoice. It doesn't say joy. What is the definition for rejoice? Great joy and delight. We're supposed to have that great joy from the birth story. Good news of great joy. But if I'm going to truly define rejoice for you, it's physically and spiritually exhibiting that joy. You're showing it to others. That's what Christian joy is. And our scripture lesson shows us we're always supposed to rejoice in the Lord, to live out that joy that we have in Him. Why should we rejoice in the Lord? Well, He's our salvation and our strength. He came to defeat sin and death. He humbled Himself for us on the cross. And He will return. These things make me joy. We turn up Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which cling so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We're in a race right now, and that race is our lives. And just if you were actually physically running, you have to pace yourself through that. You know, if you're active, actually out there and, and you're running, you're going to have uphills, you're going to have downhills. And those uphills are going to be much more challenging. You've got to be prepared for them. But you also have these downhills where it gets a little easier at times. But if you're not careful on those downhills when it's a little easier, you're going to trip and fall right under. And, you know, if we look at part two of this verse, we're supposed to look to Jesus, our founder and perfecter of our faith. You see, he's already run this race. He's already completed this race. And we can look to him to guide us through it. See, only God knows how long our lives are going to be. 
only God, and by looking to God, can we have this endurance to run the race, to achieve the prize of heavenly glory. But what about that second price part of, the, of, of verse 2? Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He endured that cross joyfully for all of us. You know, he had that mission to save us. And by completing that mission, we can be his joy and crown. That's why he did it. And he took joy in the fact that he was redeeming the world. And he was willing to bear the sorrows as part of that sacrifice. What can our trials in life compare to what he endured for us? And he endured it joyfully. Our joy comes through Christ. And I want to go back to Philippians. Now, if you were to open your Bible, some of them will actually have a subtitle under Philippians. It won't be in our few Bible up yet, sorry. But how to live. The subtitle of Philippians is How to Live. And you know what I would add to that? Joy. Philippians, to me, is how to live joyfully. Because if you're not familiar with this book, Paul takes great joy in encouraging the book of the church in Philippi. And if you're not aware of Paul's circumstances, he's actually writing this letter to that church while he's in prison. Yet you'd never know it. Because his tone is nothing but upbeat and encouraging throughout. And he's still working very hard, even though he's separated from the church who he's longing to be with. He's still working hard to advance the message of Christ. And he's still working hard to advance the message of joy and how to live that out. We go to Philippians 2, 14 through 18. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. That's joy in all things right there. That's joy in any circumstance. And, and if I focus on verse 15 for a minute, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Well, there was darkness then. There's still darkness now. And we're meant to be displaying the light as Christians in that darkness. And I'm telling you right now, you can't do that without joy. It just doesn't work. It won't happen. Paul never complained that he was in prison. You won't find in that letter to the church of Philippine, get me out of here. No, he knows he's there to do God's work. Maybe a little differently than he would have liked to, but he's still there to do it. And how did he do that? Well, guess what? He preached the good news to his guards. He shared the word with them. He took advantage of the audience that he had. And because of that, he was able to write letters and distribute these letters. And can you imagine the joy that must have happened in those churches when they received the letter from Paul? The man who was instrumental in helping start this early church now sends them a letter with encouragement and news. You've got to remember, at this time, a letter was extremely rare. People couldn't read and write. It wasn't the norm. But he took this opportunity to, to continue to spread the word and to give joy and encouragement to these early churches, to promote the good news and continue to give them instructions on how to share that with other people. That's how strongly he felt about the work that God commissioned him to do. He took joy in it. You know, and, and, and to have this encouragement message, that to be thinking of others before myself, that's a message that I need to hear. And that's a message that I need to practice. And I have a model demonstrated to me through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but also in his servant Paul. I see that model there. And Paul is demonstrating through his actions that model of servant. We put up Philippians 2, 1 through 3. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, 
any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. That's servanthood. Put others before you. And Paul's demonstrating that. And he's demonstrating that to the church and he's instructing them to go live this out. And, and you notice in verse 2, he's saying, by doing this, you're going to complete my joy. Being unified. Modeling the servant life. And I feel like there's more to that with Paul, too. I feel like, you know, completing his joy is also the enhancement of others' joy. The enhancement of that good news so that others can continue to spread the message. Because that was so key of the early church. The word had to continue to be brought out to the people. And that's what he's instructing them to do. You know, in the book of Colossians, Paul actually writes, share this letter with the church in Laodicea. You know, and I know that happened. Why do I know that happened? Because those letters are in the New Testament now. And those letters are continuing to be shared. We're continuing to share the good news. Through Paul's letters, I can't imagine Paul thought that this was going to one day be published so that everybody would have access to it. But that's exactly the impact that it had. That was God's plan, and Paul was obedient, and he lived it out. Hopefully it's bringing some joy. I guess the question I have to ask, is joy happiness? Well, not necessarily. See, I can be happy, but not joyful. I can be joyful, but I can also be sad. I think the example that comes to mind with that is at the funeral of a believer. Be sad because it's lost somebody. Somebody may be here to me. But I can have joy in knowing that they've received their reward. I can take joy from that. See, I'm happy when things are good. I think most people are. Things are going well, you're going to be happy. But is that necessarily of God? I'd even argue that I'm too likely to attribute my happiness to myself, the things that I perceive are in my own control. But to be joyful, well, I can have joy in all circumstances because of my relationship with God, and only because of that. Knowing He has a plan for me, Knowing he gave his one and only son as a sacrifice for my sin. That can bring the joy. I don't have to be happy to be joyful. I'm going to ask that you put up a question. This is an accountability question that I use. It's not mine. It's from a man named Rod Handley. He has a ministry called Character That Counts. It says, have you allowed any person or circumstances to rob you of your joy? I use this every week. Men I trust ask me this question. And I have to honestly answer them. And tell them the times when I've allowed something to rob me of my joy. And when I reflect on this question, when I'm honest about it, it's usually something really silly that I've allowed to rob Paul's in prison writing letters encouraging churches, exhibiting joy, and I'm allowing getting stuck in a traffic jam to rob me of my joy. I'm allowing something not going my way to rob me of my joy. The snow, the cold, eight more days till Christmas, and my shopping's not done. <laughs> I'm allowing these things to rob me of my joy. And two words stick out in this question. Two words. You and Rob. You, because guess what? God's not taking my joy away. Only I can allow somebody to take my joy away. And Rob. Because Rob means taking something away that you treasure. Who am I allowing to rob me of something that I should be treasuring? 
Why, if I would have joy in all things, do I let it so easily slip away? Only I can give up that gift of God. Can we put up Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8? With this verse this summer, I had my aha moment with these verses. And it spoke to me in a way it never did. It says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. The riches of his grace. We were uh, singing along with the worship team in it with Emmanuel, God with us. And all of a sudden, part of the verse spoke to me. A love you cannot afford. That's the riches of his grace. Mm -hmm. A love you cannot afford. Mm -hmm. and, and how does that Ephesians follow it up? How does Paul follow it up? Which he lavished on us. Lavished. You are not skimping. You're lavishing something. You're going all out. You're laying it on thick. And that's what God did with his grace. Amen. We can't afford it. We don't deserve it. And yet he still lavishes it, up, up, it on us. That's a treasure Amen. that we should be taking joy from. And if I tie this in, if I tie this in with the parable of the hidden treasure, which is Matthew 13, 44, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. You know, how much value am I putting on the treasure of the kingdom? It's rich beyond measure. And I should be giving up everything I own willingly so that I can have it and the joy that it brings. This is the greatest gift that you could ever receive. The greatest Christmas present, greatest birthday present, greatest gift you could ever, ever hope to receive. And it's available freely to you by just accepting Jesus as your Savior. We have that. And we should have joy because of that. You know, when I allow any person or circumstance to rob me of my joy, am I truly spreading the good news? Am I truly shining the light in the darkness? Am I truly putting behind that old sinful life that when I took Jesus as my Savior, I swore I was putting away that old self? No. I meant to protect and cherish this treasure. But that doesn't mean we're supposed to hoard it. We're meant to share this treasure. We're meant to share this gift with others. And I think that naturally comes into the question of, well, how do we do that? Well, that's for somebody else. I can't share that. I don't have the words to say. I'm not going to do that. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. And you can do it. And you know how? By personalizing it. By making it about how the joy of the gift of the riches of His grace has meant on you. What it means to you. What it means to have that relationship with God. And how you, even though you struggle to live it out, you still want to. You have to share it. Don't worry about the textbook answers. Trust that God's going to give you the words. And by personalizing it and making it about you, guess what? You're going to make it relatable to somebody else. You know, when we see that, we see that scripturally, that anybody can do this. We put up Luke 2.17. And this follows the, uh, the lesson that we heard about in the Advent reading. This is the shepherds. When they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. This is the shepherds after they went and they saw Jesus in the manger. They went out and they told everybody else about what they saw. They shared the good news. They didn't keep it to themselves. They didn't keep that great joy of the good news to themselves. They went out and they shared that. That's what we're supposed to do. You know, in... in, in a lot of times we hear about, well, well, the negative people bring me down. <clears throat> it's all that negativity that brings me down. I admit, that happens with me too. But let me tell you something about joy. It's contagious. 
When you're, in, when you're surrounded by that negativity, don't run from it. Infuse it with your joy. Share your joy, turn it around. And guess what? You can use the scripture lesson to do that. Oh, it was really cold out today, Gary. Rejoice in the Lord, oh. <laughs> no, but it was really, really cold. It was so I could barely car start my car. I'll say it again, rejoice. <laughs> if anything, you've given them something to think about. But perhaps they're going to say, well, what do you mean? Now you have your opening. Now you can share it. <clears throat> Take joy in that. Look for those opportunities. Don't run from them. A couple of weeks ago, Chrissy explained Advent to us and explained, you know, about the two parts of Advent. We have the celebration of Jesus' birth, but we also have the celebration and the expectation of his return, the second Advent. And that's absolutely something we should take and enjoy. We can't look beyond that. We can't miss out on talking about that. We put up Isaiah 35.10. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. We've been ransomed by Christ. We've been ransomed through his blood, the sacrifice of his blood. And guess what? That's meant to bring us everlasting joy. The sorrow, the sighing, that goes away. The joy remains. And that's something to look forward to. And then look at Jesus' own words on this, John 16, 19 through 20. Jesus knew they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, Is this what you are asking yourselves, what I meant by saying, A little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. Isn't that going to be a joyful moment when Christ returns? The sorrow, the pain, the suffering, it's gone. Replaced with joy. The joy only our Savior can bring. So, you know, this, this message of joy, it holds much higher than When you're out there and you see it sanitized in the world and they've scrubbed the whole word Christmas from everything, I still see the word joy. <laughs> see the meaning that that has to us as believers. The meaning that has to us knowing that Christ came and will return again. And the joy that we can have in that. And I see that single word joy. Maybe others are looking at it as the joy of the season. That's the joy I have. I can't, only I can't take that away. See, I see joy in creation. God created all things. I take joy in that, in the beauty of that. I take joy in the word that he's given us so that we can have a relationship with him. I take joy in my fellowship with all of you. I receive joy through my relationship with God. We have joy because of the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross for us. We have joy because he conquered sin and death. We have joy because of the promise of his return. And we need to rejoice and joyfully prepare for that return. So I want to ask you again, have you allowed any person or circumstance to rob you of your joy? Do you truly have the gift of the riches of his grace? If not, I want to invite you up after service. I want to pray with you. I want to be able to share with you my joy. And others are willing to do that too. Don't leave here without that joy. It's special. It's the greatest gift you'll ever have. In this Advent series, we've heard messages of hope, and peace, and joy. Next week, Steve Nebu, he's going to uh, give us a message on love. Chrissy talked about waiting in hope and aligning our hope with God's will. How to live out that hope and how to encourage others in hope. 
Kathy talked about the state of wholeness that peace brings, how peace and righteousness are meant to go hand in hand, and how Jesus fulfills that requirement of righteousness for us. I want to leave you with this today. Because of Jesus, I have hope, which fills me with peace and allows me to be joyful. Father, I just thank you. I thank you for the joy that only you can bring. I thank you for the joy that you allow us in knowing you, knowing that you truly sacrificed yourself for us so that we can have a relationship with you, Father. And I just ask that you give us the words, the ability to share this message of joy, to share it with others, to live it year-round, to be the light in our gardens, Father, to joyfully live our lives with you.